So, um, thank you again for the introduction and of course, I am also one of the organizers. So, the thing is uh, he talked about my research interest in the area of micro nanoscale uh, multiphase flows and so on. So, you may be wondering why am I going to talk something on gas turbine combustor cooling. So, we have a lot of experts in the next two days who are going to talk about liquid cooling, a single phase or phase change heat transfer and so on and so forth. So, I thought maybe I can cover uh, one of the important aspects of thermal management, but not in batteries or electronics, but in gas turbine combustors, you know, because uh, this is also a very important uh, application where thermal management is considered very seriously. And we had a couple of PhD students, uh, I think we have one of the former PhD student here and we had a postdoc. So, they were helping me in looking at this important problem of gas turbine cooling. So, I am going to talk about what kind of experiments and approach we did, a uh, little bit of optimization which Professor Balaji touch, touched upon that we used in our studies. So, just to give an overview, so I think most of you know about the functioning of a gas turbine. So, it is uh, basically having a compressor, combustion chamber and a turbine and uh, you know that the efficiency of the Brayton cycle uh, for the gas turbine uh, engine is always a function of the pressure ratio, uh, which means that it is a function of temperature ratio as well and also the type of uh, the fluid, the gas that you are using. So, these are the two main parameters which d drive the efficiency of the gas turbine cycle and uh, therefore, if you want to improve the gas turbine efficiency, you have to increase the temperature ratios, which mean the combustion temperatures are going to be very important. So, the higher the combustion temperature, so the higher the inlet temperature of the turbine blade. So, you have more enthalpy difference to convert to work and you get better efficiency for a given uh, uh, heat input. So, then how are we going to achieve this uh, higher temperatures? So, so, now we have newer fuels uh, which can be burnt more efficiently. You have the atomizing technology, we have uh, basically efficient mixing of the fuel and air through this atomizer and uh, improving the uh, basically the combustion as close to the stoichiometric values as possible, so that you can burn uh, temper and achieve the temperatures which are as high as uh, that we get from the adiabatic flame temperatures. But we have another problem here is it is not just about getting uh, temperatures uh, uh, as high as possible, but how do we manage these high temperature components? Because the components which are basically uh, subjected to these high temperatures in the combustor or the turbine blade <coughs> undergo uh, thermal stresses and thermal fatigue uh, due, due to repeated cycles of heating and cooling and this is going to cause a component failure. So, therefore, thermal management is going to be a very important part of uh, the combustor um, and this shows the kind of uh, the combustion section uh, in a gas turbine combustor where you see these angry red. These are literally angry red means these are zones of very high temperatures in the primary and in the secondary where you have the uh, highest flame temperatures and the combustion liner which is basically the supporting structure is uh, subjected to this kind of very high temperatures and we have to consider the cooling when we design such high temperatures. To get a uh, view of the different zones of the combustor, uh, you have the primary zone, you have the basically a secondary zone and a, a tertiary or dilution zone. And in the primary zone essentially is where you bring in the atomized uh, fuel, you mix it with air and then you burn it. So, usually the burning is basically a stoichiometric or a slightly rich uh, uh, mixture uh, there and therefore, the temperatures are very high in the primary zone and followed by some dilution through the secondary and the dilution regions, you dilute it, uh, dilute the mixture and therefore, you probably reduce the temperature of the flame a uh, bit. So, the typical temperatures that you see in the primary zone are about 2400 Kelvin, which is very high and in the intermediate or secondary zone, it is about 2000 Kelvin and finally, in the dilution zone, it is about 1800 Kelvin. So, finally, we bring down the temperature due to progressive dilution uh, within the combustion chamber, but then if you look at the modes of heat transport, if you take a combustor liner, this is the structure basically in which within which the entire combustion is happening and this liner is subjected to multiple heat loads, which are coming from the convection and the radiation on the hot gas side. 
that is the side where the flame is exposed to the combustor liner and on the other side where it is exposed to the cold air. So, the cold air is supplied through this annular passages and therefore, on the other side you have the convection, uh, you have the radiation to the exchange with the cold air which is trying to maintain these uh, liner within the desirable limits and within the liner itself you have the conduction. So, essentially it is a conjugate heat transfer problem. So, from the hot gas side to the cold gas side you have to solve convection, radiation, conduction all simultaneously to get the correct prediction for the combustion temper uh, liner temperatures and accordingly then you can plan the thermal management. And uh, this uh, plot here is very interesting, it shows the evolution of the combustor uh, exit temperatures over the years. So, initially when the combustor liner was not cooled at all, your combustion temperatures were limited to about 1100 Kelvin, uh, in, in this case it is degree Celsius, so it is about 1100 degree Celsius and now with the introduction of film cooling techniques and uh, use of thermal barrier coating, so someone was asking about TBC, so TBC is very important uh, in kind of high temperature components to protect them like the combustor liners or the turbine blades. <coughs> so, once we introduce film cooling, so we could uh, go to a much higher uh, combustion temperatures and with the introduction of <coughs> film cooling with a thermal barrier coating which reduces the thermal conductivity and therefore, uh, reduces the heat load uh, directly to the combustor liner, we could easily go to even higher temperatures. And now, we are replacing the TBC with what is called as a EBC which is an environmental barrier coating. So, the conventional TBCs are subject, subject to oxidation. So, and over a period of time the thermal performance, the thermal conductivity change is due to oxidation and to prevent this an oxidation resistant layer is also coated on top of the TBC which is called as an environmental barrier coating. And with the advancement in the material technology, we can now go to higher and higher flame temperatures which are almost touching 1800 degrees Celsius. So, these are you know the positive ways by which you can improve the efficiency of the gas turbine combustors and cooling becomes a very important part of this. Now, need for cooling is as you can <coughs> see obviously, there are visually cracks which are developing due to very high thermal stresses or thermal fatigue. So, you can see in the combustor uh, liner, these are actual photographs people have taken in aircraft engine companies. So, where they have subjected this combustor liner to repeated uh, cycles of uh, heating and cooling and uh, they have developed cracks and uh, holes. So, how do we cool the combustor liners? What are the different ways? So, we have different techniques, you know we have film cooling techniques, we have effusion cooling or we have a combination of film and effusion cooling which is called hybrid cooling. So, in the case of uh, film cooling, we pass the uh, coolant through a slots or holes uh, which are drilled into these uh, liner walls and then this forms a protective uh, barrier against the hot gases, um, between the hot gases and the combustor liner, keeps the combustor liner relatively cooler. And on top of that, you can also have a coating of uh, the thermal barrier coating on top of the liner as an additional insulation um, uh, layer. And apart from that, the other types of cooling is uh, drill holes and then uh, we have uh, coolant directly uh, going across the liner walls and this is called an effusion or transpiration cooling. And we can also use advanced cooling techniques which uh, basically mixes the film cooling and the effusion cooling together into the same system. So, uh, this figure here right here shows about the physics of uh, how the film cooling happens, you have a coolant which is entering through a slot, um, I am sure there is a problem with the pointer if I point it away I guess. Okay. So, there is a coolant which is entering the slot and uh, basically you have a hot gas. So, the purpose of this coolant is to protect the combustor liner wall which is at the bottom from the hot gas and uh, this is actually a problem what we call as a wall jet. So, near the wall you have a boundary layer and far away from the wall you have a jet and when these two mix, you have both the characteristics of a boundary layer velocity profile coupled with the wall jet away from the uh, surface and you have a very strange combination which results in this kind of a variation in the velocity profiles. And we uh, use a metric called the adiabatic film cooling effectiveness uh, which is uh, a performance metric to say how well the combustor liner is cooled by your uh, cooling technique. You know. So, the value of adiabatic film cooling effectiveness of 1 
means that your liner is kept exactly at the same temperature as the coolant and if it is zero that means it's completely uncooled and it is taking the same temperature as your hot gas and obviously we have now a very clear objective uh, if you want to optimize this cooling design we have to maximize the film cooling effectiveness and uh, this is a typical uh, schematic of the film cooling from experiments that we did on <coughs> um, uh, surfaces which are exposed to hot gas and this uh, coolant and shows the contours of the adiabatic film cooling effectiveness. Usually in this kind of a film cooling, the adiabatic effectiveness is higher um, at the inlet and then it progressively reduces and becomes very worse towards the exit of the liner. So this therefore shows the pattern of uh, film cooling effectiveness for the three different types of cooling te techniques I have mentioned. So for the film cooling, usually you have the maximum cooling effectiveness at the inlet and then it progressively reduces and goes to a very small value away from the uh, inlet and if you look at the effusion cooling it is the other way so because you are continuously adding mass flux so as you go downstream you are having more coolant mass flux to cool and therefore the effectiveness progressively increases downstream. So the idea what we have got is why not combine both the film cooling and effusion cooling to get the more uniform distribution of uh, temperature or cooling effectiveness. So in this case we have a coolant supplied through the slot and as well as through the effusion holes and when we look at the effectiveness it is looking more uniform than what we get from pure film cooling or pure effusion. So this is called the hybrid cooling. And coming to what are the parameters that are required, see uh, the problem is this is an aircraft engine so this is subject to a very high pressure. Uh, conditions and high temperature conditions. So when I am going to study this uh, in my uh, lab, so I cannot obviously build a complete engine and test it. So to study only the combustion cooling performance, I have to build a scaled down model or a, a model which is operating at lab conditions, so close to lab temperature and pressure. So then how do I compare that my film cooling effectiveness that I measure at my lab scale is comparable to what I see in the engine? because the engine is at a much uh, higher pressure and temperature conditions. So I have to define a set of uh, rules which are called uh, similarity rules and these parameters have to be maintained <laughs> similar between the lab and the engine conditions in order to get an accurate estimate of my film cooling effectiveness. So these are some of the parameters. One is called the blowing ratio which is basically the ratio of the mass flux of the coolant to the mass flux of the hot gas and uh, this is defined as uh, basically the density times velocity of the coolant by density times velocity of the hot gas and the other ratio is the density ratio. So if I maintain this blowing ratio and density ratio the same between the lab and the engine conditions, so I have the important similarity parameters matched and my effectiveness uh, will be accurate. And if I match these two obviously my velocity ratio will also be matched, my momentum flux ratio will also be matched, so these four will be taken for granted. But on top of this you have additional parameters which strictly require to be matched for exact similarity but we usually which are difficult, one is the hot gas Reynolds number, the other is the Reynolds number ratio which is the ratio of the coolant Reynolds number to the hot gas and uh, the seventh parameter is called the advective capacity ratio. So these three are usually little difficult because at lab scale you are not working at the same temperature and same temperature ratios. So usually the advective capacity ratio will obviously not be able to match because uh, heat capacity is a function of temperatures. Same way with the Reynolds number, you know we are working on a smaller system here and therefore matching the same Reynolds number is also a little difficult. Uh, so these are secondary parameters but I would say the more important parameters are blowing ratio and density ratio and most of the literature people try to maintain these two fixed and that should be good enough to get an accurate prediction of effectiveness. And then when we define the performance we have two different uh, film cooling effectiveness. One is the adiabatic cooling effectiveness in which uh, we have the coolant uh, which is going like this, you have the mainstream. And on the back side of the liner we completely insulate the system so that there is no heat that is lost to the surrounding. So this is uh, a laboratory case uh, which is not the actual engine condition but this will give you a maximum estimate of the temperature that you get you know. So the higher the value of temperature the worst is your performance. So if you can design a cooling system which can tackle the 
maximum temperature that should work very well even at actual engine conditions. Now in an actual engine condition, so you all obviously have a heat loss to the coolant which is flowing through the annular side and therefore that kind of effectiveness that you get is called the overall effectiveness. So how do we differentiate between these two? So we use the adiabatic temperature as far as the film cooling effectiveness based on adiabatic condition is concerned and we use the actual temperature uh, in which already there is a heat loss in the case of overall effectiveness. So as I said, you know, your adiabatic temperature is much greater, uh, going to be much greater than your actual temperature and therefore your uh, eta adiabatic will be basically much smaller than your overall uh, effectiveness. So the effectiveness uh, that you estimate from adiabatic conditions will usually be the worst case effectiveness. So if you design a cooling system for this value, I think you will do a much better job in the actual engine conditions. And what, what are we going to optimize and how are we going to do that? So we look at the uh, effectiveness in two ways. One is the average value of the effectiveness on the entire combustor liner. The other is what is the standard deviation? So that is the variation in the effectiveness distribution that you see. So in order to bring these two parameters, we use them as the objective functions. So that is the effectiveness average and the standard deviation. So in our case, uh, the desirable uh, way to optimize this will be to maximize your average effectiveness and minimize your standard deviation. <coughs> so these are the main objective functions. So in our experiments and simulation, what we have done is uh, we have taken a single liner first uh, to study the cooling system for this and we have done the experiments and simulation at laboratory conditions where we maintain a density ratio of 1.1 and we also create a higher density ratio. As I said, the two important similar similarity parameters are blowing ratio and density ratio. So if your density ratio has to be 2.6 in lab condition, you have to use a high density gas. So that's what we do in the uh, laboratory. In case of simulation, we can actually do this uh, by elevating the pressure and temperature. So once we do this at lab condition, we also do the simulations at engine conditions and we generate a lot of uh, parameters and then we have to now go into the optimization problem. So we have to optimize and get the best design. So to do that, we use uh, different configurations for creating a surrogate model. So the surrogate model we use is Krigging. I'll explain about Krigging very shortly, but there are of course response surface Krigging and neural networks. These are many approaches to uh, building a, um, a kind of a model for predicting the objective functions as a function of these uh, engine parameters and then we test this optimum geometry, we create, we de design the optimum geometry based on using the uh, Krigging coupled with a genetic algorithm and then we test this optimum geometry again at laboratory conditions to verify the aut authenticity of the optimization approach and uh, th then we also looked at the other complexities that we have. <coughs> For example, we extend this to a hybrid cooling configuration and we study the effect of gas radiation. So when we do the initial set of studies at lab conditions and uh, uh, engine conditions also. So the lab conditions obviously are not at high temperature. So we ignore the effect of radiation which is very important at engine condition. So we include the effect of radiation later on on the optimized configuration at engine conditions and we uh, look at the uh, impact of radiation on the film cooling. So when we start with the 3D slot jet configuration, we have several of these geometric parameters of the coolant. So these are the slot height, jet diameter, lip angle, lip length, injection angle <coughs> and uh, the pitch between, the separation between the holes in a three-dimensional configuration and we have a range of all these parameters. So we get the range based on the current uh, aircraft gas turbine engine uh, configuration and then we pick out of this two reference cases from the current engine, so as a benchmark with which we can compare our optimized configuration and check the performance improvement. In the experiments, what we do is we use both the transient method and the unsteady method. So in the case of transient method, it uh, relies on the semi-infinite approximation. So we pass uh, coolant gas close to 30 degrees and a hot gas at 40 degree. And uh, this is the initial transient approach, you know, where the heat is only penetrating very close to the surface. It is not penetrated completely and left. So it is actually adiabatic if you look at it in this sense. but this is at the early transient. You can actually solve the semi-infinite equations with uh, your convective boundary conditions at the surface and uh, you can uh, solve the solution for temperature of the wall 
and in fact you will get uh, equation like this. I think many of you have seen this in the heat transfer textbook. So if you solve this uh, uh, equation for temperature at two different time instants uh, in the early transient regime, uh, basically you will be able to solve for essentially the temperature of the film as well as the <coughs> heat transfer coefficient. So once you get both uh, heat transfer coefficient and uh, film temperature, so essentially all your cooling configuration design can be evolved from this. So this is the idea behind the <coughs> transient method of course, you know we also wanted to go by the conventional approach which is a steady state wherein which you have to physically insulate the back side of the uh, liner and then you have to make the measurements, you have to wait till the steady state is reached and do this. So the advantage of transient is much faster, you do not have to wait till steady state is reached, but the problem is uh, it is only going to give you the adiabatic effectiveness. Whereas with the steady state method you are measuring uh, steady state temperature and you can also extend this to a case where it is not adiabatic, you can measure the overall uh, temperature or overall effectiveness as well. In the numerical model we have considered the usual you know uh, the RANS approach, we have uh, <coughs> taken a model which is called the realizable K epsilon model with the enhanced wall treatment. So this is the model that we have done lot of background work to check uh, which is the right turbulence model which can capture the near wall uh, heat transfer coefficient and so on very accurately and we zeroed in on this particular model. And this shows the uh, validation for film cooling effectiveness based on our current experiment and both transient and the steady state experiments uh, along with the numerical model that uh, we have uh, used and we see the agreement is very good. And we have also measured not only the film cooling effectiveness but also the velocity profiles. We wanted to study how the flow pattern changes along the uh, combustor liner. So we studied the uh, velocity profiles and the turbulence profiles at different locations for different blowing ratios and we see the agreement between the numerics and experiment is excellent. So the uh, other interesting fact is you may ask okay these experiments were done at lab conditions where the density ratio is 1, so how does it compare uh, with the experiments done at density ratio of 2 with the high density gas with the actual engine experiments, uh, with the actual engine uh, numerical simulation. So that also we have compared, we see that of course you are uh, film cooling effect effectiveness at lab condition with density ratio of 1 is much lower than what you see with a density ratio of 2 and that matches very well with what we do simulations at the lab engine conditions at high temperature and high pressure. So this tells us that the similarity really works, you know. <coughs> the similarity tells you that as long as you can match the blowing ratio and the density ratio the same, it does not matter whether you are doing this at high pressure, high temperature or atmospheric pressure and near room temperatures. So that confirms what we wanted to start with. Uh, now coming into the details of the surrogate model, now we have done lot of parametric study for getting the values of uh, film cooling effectiveness as a function of all the different geometric parameters. So we are going to have a model, therefore a surrogate model which can uh, fit all these parameters uh, to the objective functions which are essentially the uh, average value of film cooling effectiveness and the standard deviation <coughs> for the next level of optimization. So of course there are different types of surrogate models as I told you, you have regression models, you have neural networks, uh, but the one that we have used is called a Kriging model. So the Kriging model is uh, basically building a Gaussian distribution for estimating the values of the function about the point. So you have, you perturbs the value of the parameters a little bit about the, the value that you have supplied, the data and then it tries to fit a curve for this at different uh, points you know and then you have a Gaussian distribution and then it takes the average of all of these uh, Gaussian distribution curves and that will be giving you the value, actual predicted value of the Kriging model. So this we found was actually very robust uh, for our particular application and we use the Kriging as the surrogate model and of course you can use the surrogate model for both as a forward as, as well as an inverse model, as a forward model you put in all the geometric parameters and you get your <coughs> output which is your effectiveness. The inverse model is for a given effectiveness, it will tell you what should be the combination of all your geometrical parameters. So in our case it is primarily a forward model which we are coupling it to the optimizer using genetic algorithms. <coughs> so op optimization I think Professor Balaji uh, is an expert and he has already given you a big overview. 
So again, you know, you have a, what, what is called a single objective optimization is what he said. You have one single parameter, one single objective, for example. So you are looking at minimizing or maximizing the uh, objective function and you are taking one single point as your optimum point. But if you have multiple objective functions, suppose in my case, I have, uh, you know, mi maximizing my average um, effectiveness and minimizing my standard deviation or in, uh, you know, heat transfer, we have this classical conflict between Nusselt number and pressure drop. So you have multiple objective functions and uh, you have multiple parameters. So how are you going to consider this? So we have two spaces. One is the variable space. You have, of course, all your geometrical variables in this space. And then you have an objective space where for each of this geometrical variable, your surrogate model is going to predict what is the value of the objective functions. Uh, in this case, you have um, a, a mean value of effectiveness and the standard deviation. And uh, here in this, you are going to take the surface which is co covering the lowest among these values. So this is actually called the Pareto optimal front. So you have along this curve, the minima, actually all the points are optimized. So it depends on what priority you want to give to one variable over the other, which will help you in picking the optimum for your particular problem. So in our case, therefore, we have two objective functions. One is <coughs> you have the maximization of your uh, mean value of film cooling effectiveness and minimizing your standard deviation. So we do the um, uh, Krigging and then we generate uh, from the uh, genetic algorithm, we generate a Pareto optimal front like this. So the question is, uh, which of these points is the right optimum for your problem? So that we give a weightage according to what we want to uh, play, give more importance to. In our case, we give 70% weightage to maximizing the uh, mean of the effectiveness and 30% weightage to minimizing the standard deviation. And then we pick one point somewhere like this. And this is what we call as our optimal solution. And how do we do this? It's uh, through the genetic algorithm and uh, the genetic algorithm is an evolutionary algorithm. So it's not going by the calculus. It's going by looking at uh, whether the next generation, uh, you know, the, uh, the solution is more optimal or better than the previous generation and finally comes to a point where it says, okay, I mean, as Professor Balaji said, I don't want to put uh, much more effort to fine tune uh, to a very high accuracy, but this is a reasonable approximation. So to check the performance of the optimized configuration, we have taken a, a few uh, uh, cases. Uh, we have taken the optimal point. We have, ta we have the two reference cases. And then uh, we have compared what is the uh, performance of our optimum configuration over the reference configuration. So as you can see, we have defined a performance index because we have two objective functions. So we have combined these two. So we said we have to maximize your eta, minimize your standard deviation. So why not have a ratio eta by uh, sigma and say maximize this single parameter. And then we, we want to know whether this is actually better than your reference configuration. So we normalize it with the value of uh, uh, eta by sigma for the baseline configuration and we call this as a performance parameter. And obviously if your performance parameter has to be greater than one, then the optimal configuration is doing better than your reference configuration. And as we see here, um, for bo against both the reference configurations, the uh, performance index is well above one. So we are getting about 20, 30 percent improvement in the performance index over the baseline configurations. The other way of looking at it from the aircraft uh, combustor engineer point of view, so he is not only concerned about maximizing the cooling, cooling efficiency, but for a given cooling efficiency, how can I reduce my uh, coolant flow rate? How can I reduce the flow rate that I supply to the uh, cooling passages? So that is again an inverse problem which we have back calculated. We know what is the efficient, uh, what is the effectiveness of the reference configuration, which is fairly good enough, acceptable. So for that effectiveness, what will be the mass flow rate of our optimal configuration? So this is an inverse problem, and we have estimated that from the inverse problem is about 20, 25 percent reduction in the mass flow rate that we'll get if you still maintain the same cooling efficiency as the baseline configuration, we can bring down the coolant supply with the optimal configuration by about 20 to 25 percent, which is a significant improvement. So this is the, these are two different ways we think, because as an academician, we only want to define a parameter to improve the efficiency. But from a practical engineer, he wants to see, well, I already have a reasonable cooling, but I want to reduce the coolant supply. So if what will happen if I use your 
uh, optimum configuration, I want to reduce the coolant supply. And that is the other perspective that we have also looked at. Then we have extended the same kind of uh, design and optimization concept to a hybrid configurations uh, which I have explained where you have a combination of both film cooling which shows an eta variation like this uh, combined with an effusion cooling which shows an eta variation like this and when we combine these two we get a more or less uniform variation of eta over the entire liner which is what we desire. And yes we went ahead and we optimized the parameters of this hybrid cooling as well. We have one additional complexity here uh, in the hybrid cooling is we introduce a mass flow ratio. This is the split between the coolant that enters through the slot versus uh, what is going through the effusion hole. And if your mass flow rate is basically zero, that means it's purely effusion cooling. And if your mass flow rate is very high, tending to infinity, that means it is a pure slot cooling. So your actual value will be somewhere in between these two. So we wanted to find out again what will be the optimum value of MFR that will give us uh, a better cooling performance than either the film cooling or the effusion cooling. And we found that MFR of 5 is actually quite optimal in this case. And uh, we have compared uh, what is the effectiveness variation over the liner uh, for the baseline geometry versus uh, the optimized uh, film cooling geometry versus the optimized hybrid geometry. You can see the performance of the, uh, opti the, the hybrid geometry is very good only in the last a part of the liner because that is where the film cooling shows a drastic drop in the effectiveness. The effusion can boost up that value. So you do not see a big improvement in the initial region but in the towards the trailing edge of the liner is where you see a substantial improvement in the performance of the hybrid combustor. And this translates into lower temperatures as you can see we have compared the temperature distribution um, actually these are all. Uh, coming from the experiment. So we also went back to the lab from the optimized configuration. We conducted the experiments uh, in the lab and we verified whether the optimized configuration is really better than the baseline. And these are from the infrared camera that we have taken uh, all the snapshots and we are comparing the temperature distribution. So the baseline configuration shows a very high patch towards the end. So which is slightly mitigated by the optimized configuration. The penetration of the coolant is better in the optimized slot configuration and once we go to the hybrid configuration actually the distribution is even better towards the trailing edge where the hot spot is mitigated and even the distribution is more uniform than the baseline. So that, that is what we have done in the optimization. So we wanted to improve not only the value of uh, film cooling effectiveness but reduce the non-uniformity right and that is what we see in terms of temperature uniformity. So now the final. Uh, crux of this problem is all, all of this we have done at conditions where you do not consider radiation and the very first slide I showed the energy balance. You also have radiation as very important uh, source of heat transfer to the liner on the hot gas especially because of the high combustion temperatures. So uh, then how do we take care of the radiation effects? So we cannot do of course the radiation experiments. So we have to rely on the numerics. So we included uh, you know we took the actual jet engine fuel JP8, look at uh, the stoichiometric combustion of JP8 uh, and all the products of uh, JP8 and uh, we looked at the different equivalence ratios that is uh, the actual air fuel to the stoichiometric values and uh, we looked at different products of species that you get and this is going to influence your radiation because as you know radiation depends on the emissivity uh, and scattering uh, coming from these species which contribute to the radiation heat flux. And uh, in this case uh, water vapor for example is a very important effect plus CO2 and CO. So these have emissivities which can actually improve the radiation heat transfer rate and uh, we have to consider this. So how are we considering we solve the radiation transport equation RT and uh, the uh, emissivity is an average emissivity because each of these species have their own spectral emissivity over wavelength they exhibit uh, 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 variation in the emissivity. So how do we account for is we take a uh, average of all this over the wavelength and we use what is the weighted sum of a gray gas model. So we weight all these uh, em different emissivities and we have a single emissivity which goes into the radiation heat transfer model. And using that we try to assess what is the effect of radiation on effectiveness and to our surprise we find that once you account for radiation there is an ad additional uh, mode of heat transfer uh, from the hot gas without 
uh, having to go through a medium. So it is directly going from the hot gas to the liner and uh, you see the effectiveness comes down drastically. We see that if you do not consider the radiation, the effectiveness is about 0.83. Now once you include the radiation effects, there is a drop of 23.5 percent in the effectiveness. So whatever we think is actually a good cooled combustor will uh, become uh, really perform really bad in actual engine conditions once radiation effects are included. And therefore what do we do? So uh, we have to do something to improve the efficiency further. We uh, look at the contribution of the thermal barrier coating, okay. So uh, that is why in actual aircraft. Uh, combustor uh, and turbine blade, you have a thermal barrier coating to further insulate the liner from the hot gases because of the radiation effects and uh, the thermal barrier coating has a low thermal conductivity. It is uh, usually uh, some kind of a ceramic material. Uh, the one that we uh, used is a yttria stabilized zirconia and uh, with that there is a substantial increase again in the enhancement by about 12 percent, so which is good. But the final uh, story is uh, whether the optimal design that we have designed, uh, we have optimized through this process, whether it does it work even with the radiation effects included and we have shown the final comparison of effectiveness wherein we compare against both the references, your <coughs> enhancement is still fine even if you consider the radiation effects, the optimum configuration is still showing a higher enhancement. It is not very high, but it is about 10 percent uh, compared to your reference configuration. So in that sense, yes, uh, our optimum design should be working even in the actual engine conditions including the effects of radiation, but uh, we have to definitely make use of the thermal barrier coating because uh, without that there is a serious loss in the uh, film cooling performance. And also in terms of the uh, temperatures, this is what you see, you know, with the, without, with the gas radiation the temperature again goes up. This is due to the radiation heat flux coming in and again with the use of thermal barrier coating this can be mitigated uh, to some extent. So these are the conclusions, uh, most important conclusion is we have a methodology for the design and optimization of film cooling in gas turbine combustors using a combination of uh, surrogate model like what we use Kriging in uh, top of which we have a genetic algorithm, we can make use of this. And uh, not only that, we have also shown that the similarity law works, you know you do not have to do these experiments or simulations at the engine conditions, you can do them at low pressure conditions and still uh, get an accurate estimate of effectiveness. And finally the effectiveness, uh, the radiation plays a very important role on effectiveness and the uh, performance using thermal barrier coating also is important. So with that uh, I thank my. Uh, co-PI Professor Balaji who worked on this project with GTRE and my student Ananda Prasanna for this work. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So I think we have about 5 minutes because we are running short of time. I am remembering correctly, if yeah. you, are, you are not taking the properties of the materials. The properties, uh, not the material. Material. So yeah. if I, let us say if, uh, I am doing uh, an experiments with uh, another material, will I get the similar results? Yeah, here this is a function of only the fluid and not the solid property so the except the radiation. Yes, yeah. so let us say mm, you did an experiments with metal, I did an experiments with mm, uh, plastics. Yeah. Mm, and. Uh, so mm. as long as the steady state results are concerned, it should no, not but change. But the conjugate heat transfer will be different, right? Mm. Yes, correct. So, so in the similarity that no, the metal that we have taken for the conjugate model is very close to the aircraft uh, material thermal conductivity, but not in the experiment, but in the simulation, yes. So the conductivity should not be there in the mm, As far as the overall effectiveness is concerned, it will matter, but not for the adiabatic effectiveness because okay. that is just mm. a steady state result which you apply with the adiabatic boundary. So the conduction through the material there will not matter, but for the overall effectiveness, yes, it uh, plays a role. And uh, also, you know, when the radiation effects are considered, the material will play a role. Mm. So there we yes, have sir. used the correct emissivity of the material and for calculating the overall effectiveness uh, modeling, uh, we have used the actual aircraft met metal thermal conductivities for okay. the conjugate mm -hmm. heat transfer model, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
सर हाय सर आई एम वेंकटेश आई एम ए पीएचडी स्टूडेंट हियर सर यू टॉक्ड अबाउट सरोगेट मॉडल्स लाइक कैन यू एक्सप्लेन मोर अबाउट दोस मॉडल्स लाइक एज सी सरोगेट इज बेसिकली यू नो यू नाउ हैव अ डिजाइन ऑफ एक्सपेरिमेंट्स वेयर यू हैव से थ्री पैरामीटर्स अ फुल फैक्टोरियल डीओई विद थ्री पैरामीटर्स विल बी यू नो टिपिकली यू नो 3 पावर 3 सो दिस इज 27 Uh, kind of uh, experiments or simulations that you have to do to cover the entire parameter space now with this 27 experiments you have to train a, a model either using a regression or using krigging or a neural network which can predict the uh, value of the objective function based on these values of parameters so only this 27 parameters will be the training points you have to train and build the model and using that then the model will become a predictive model so with, with which with any other in between values of these parameters it can give you what is the it predicts what is the value of the objective function at those points so that is the purpose of you know to put it in a nutshell the entire purpose of the surrogate models and of course there are different approaches you can have regression you can have neural networks but the approach that we have used is basically krigging which we have actually tried also neural networks we found the krigging is giving more stable results for us Uh, so basically it is like instead of solving all governing equations uh, you need a minimum experimental points and exactly so you model. only have a solution for say 40 points in our case we did 70 simulations uh, but even that is not sufficient to describe the entire parameter space what happens between these two parameters so now you train the uh, surrogate model and then between the parameters it's going to give you predictions so once you have factors in response you build that surrogate model and that model you use to yeah you can use that either as a forward model or a inverse model Okay. So you given objective functions, what are the going to be suitable combination of? This is what Professor Balaji was saying, you know. So, so you have your temperature, you have your thermal conductivity. You build the forward model; it will predict your temperature. Now, the inverse model is you know that uh, measurement of temperature and what is the combination of thermal conductivity that you can get. That is the inverse model. So the the surrogate model can do both. Okay. For inverse, you need to train more. For a forward model, I think uh, training with say whatever we did with seventy. data point should be good enough okay yeah. sir yeah i think final question probably yeah, yeah. very nice talk uh, one just question uh, maybe a naive question so the whole idea is in the combustor you want higher temperatures for higher efficiency but then on the liner side uh, there are material limitations and you are trying to cool it so is exactly. there some sort of optimization of how much cooling you should do without uh compromising on the efficiency of the combustor does exactly. that come into exactly. picture exactly see we 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 have to learn the, with the fact that it's like same with electronic cooling you know you have to live with the fact that uh, you know if you want to do a more miniaturization heterogeneous integration you have to live with the fact you have to deal with high heat fluxes so same way here high combustion temperatures but then how do you mitigate uh, you know the uh, interaction with the liner surface so how do you keep the liner because the liner material is still the same so we have not been able to find uh, from the material science point uh, which is much lighter and which is more durable and can withstand such high temperatures so we still use the conventional alloys and therefore the thermal management is only to make sure the liner material is within the uh, operational limits of the material typically what what is the compromise on the efficiency due to this cooling no the efficiency is not going to be impacted because efficiency is on the bulk you know this is only a very local effect on the liner surface but no, you are not touching significant. the temperature on the flame uh, combustor side or the uh, flame that goes into the the temperature that goes into the turbine inlet this is only just uh, making sure your uh, structure is thermally uh, you know durable so you are not going to compromise on the temperatures on the surface uh, uh, on the uh, you know bulk combustor but uh, local temperatures are being kept in within the operational limits think uh, we have to move to the next talk but yeah we can take one mm. question from you sir yeah sir in that combustor liner when you are send, send, sending a cooling fluid mm. the thing is uh, uh, near the liner temperatures at the coolant inlet will be low and uh, at the exit it will be high so exactly. we, that is what you see in the stresses. film cooling uh, you see a pattern where it is high mm. efficiency is high in the inlet and then it keeps drastically dropping down that is why we see the hybrid uh, cooling is more promising um, how it will affect the thermal stresses on liner yeah, yeah it's definitely you know how it will affect we have not done the coupling of uh, uh, this uh, thermal with the structural analysis but definitely 
uh, any differential uh, temperature you know is going to lead to you know uh, cycles and uh, fatigue will be definitely there and thermal stresses are going to develop. We have not done that analysis but definitely I have shown you the experimental photographs where people have observed uh, you know cracks can develop initially and then it can lead to complete uh, the structure of the shell buckling you know. So, so that kind of uh, serious problems can happen if you do not address the combustor uh, cooling uh, issue adequately. Since in optimization that 30 percent uh, preference is given to standard deviation that is why. Yeah, I mean that is true, I mean that is a uh, mathematical problem or no, you know, so as long as you feel that the maximum temperature at the exit is still within the operational limits you do not have to worry, right. Thank so, you. the only problem comes you know where somewhere there is a hot spot and the temperature goes way above the operating then the standard deviation becomes a more important uh, uh, parameter we have to give a much bigger weightage than what we have given now. Uh, parametric study and uh, uh, effectiveness has been uh, uh, predicted based upon average uh, properties. For yeah. example, in a in a in a plane, if you consider so average temperature, so you consider like that. Yeah, I mean in this case, uh, the properties are see. I mean uh, the lab conditions are basically. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean the property variation will be hardly minimal, but yes. in the engine condition, we actually consider a thermophysical property variation. So. The properties are functions of temperature. Yeah. So, for the hybrid kind of condition, is there any flow features uh, uh, salient? Uh, we have measured the flow features, observed. but I have not shown it here. Ah. But uh, it is much more complicated because uh, you do not have just a wall jet, but now on top of wall jet, there is a transpiration cooling. So, which is going to interfere with the boundary layer, right. So, we all know that if you suck the boundary layer, your boundary layer thickness is going to decrease, and if you uh, uh, you know uh, add more uh, flow into that it is going to increase. So, that this is a typical profile that we have seen as you go downstream with the hybrid the boundary layer thickness is increasing. So, the wall jet effects are coming down and the boundary layer effects are getting more uh, important. And there. how about mixing effect of hot and cold? Yeah, so even that is the, uh, even in the basically characterized by what we call as the turbulent intensity you know. So, how the hot gas is going to mix is depending on the turbulence. If your uh, shear turbulent shear stresses are very high, so it is going to draw the hot gases more uh, into the which is not desirable. So, this is one place where turbulent intensity is going to play an undesirable effect. Whereas, in heat exchangers, we like turbulence because the heat transfer is better, the mixing oh. is better, and heat transfer is better. But here, we want to avoid the heat exchange between the gas and uh, the wall. At the top of it, effusion, uh, effusion fluid and uh, secondary jet uh, fluid that uh, interaction. Uh, yeah, I think see this is a very complex uh, fluid problem. So, you have a variation everywhere, but I just gave you uh, overall you know description about what the turbulence intensity can do. It, it is actually an adverse, if the turbulent intensity is high it is going to effective uh, affect your performance adversely in this case is what I was trying to say. Okay, so thank you. Momento to Professor Arvind Patamata.